any sense. Praising when it doesn't make sense. Acts chapter 16. We'll start reading in verse number 16. Uh, down, we'll read to down to 25, but then we'll talk about, of course, Paul and Silas in uh, the jails uh, from 25 through 34, but we'll start out reading here in Acts 16, verse 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass as we went to pray. This is where all this got started. I want you to think about that and focus on that. We talked about this some time back. Uh, but that's where it's at. That's what we're going to look at this morning. As it came, and, and, it, and it came to pass as we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul in us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, what a, what a thing to be said about somebody. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Notice he didn't address her. He addressed the Spirit in her. Big difference. A lot of times we look at people and we say, shame on them, the person. Shame on the person. No, it's what's in them. Amen. It's causing the issues. Verse 19 says, And when he... And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, he messed with their pocketbooks is what he done. Cast the spirit out because the spirit was giving them uh, uh, gains or money because of her uh, being able, being possessed, and being able to be like a fortune teller or whatever was able to tell people's fortune. And she was making them a lot of money, and they didn't like it because Paul cast that evil spirit out that was causing them to get all that money. Uh, so they didn't care nothing about the girl. They wanted what she could do for them, and they didn't like it. And said, I hope of their gains were gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. As they went to pray, the Bible said, they wasn't doing nothing. They was minding their own business. Hey, man, they wasn't doing a thing. They, were, they didn't go up and start aggravating the girl. They didn't go up and have an uh, exorcism with the girl. They didn't meet her at her house. She started following them. He got tired of it, turns around and said, I'm tired of this. It's time for you to come out. And when it did, it, it caused it. But look at what they're saying about these guys. Brought them to magistrates saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to, do, to, to observe being Romans. Verse 22 said, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded, them, commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast him into, the, into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks and at midnight. Amen. Amen. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. We'll stop right there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity once again to be able to come. God, I hope that you show us through this scripture as you have me uh, and show us that... Uh, how important it is uh, to stay connected in prayer to you. And God, to see what these men did and the importance of prayer and praise and, and how it affects our life. Things I believe that we neglect probably the most of is devotion and prayer and a prayer life that we overlook. Uh, as we talked about in Sunday school, the meditation part that we need to get back to. We're so busy watching the news, so busy on coming up with ideas to how to make uh, our country better and how to make it great again and how to keep everything, uh, the violence uh, at a minimum, uh, God. And I think what we need to do at the church starting right here today on Sunday morning is starting to pray again. God, I pray that we can get this into the hearts of our people and maybe this will spread 
because we see what uh, how just a prayer or a devoted life uh, of devotion uh, what it can cause the stir up that it can cause not in a bad way in a good way uh, God how they were recognized for going down to pray God, I pray that you let us see this and help us to understand how important that is in the life of a believer. That's how we survive. That's how we stay charged up is having a life of prayer. We love you. We praise you and thank you. If there's any in our midst that's lost and don't know you, we pray that they get saved today. And for those that are here and maybe have just uh, laid down the cross, maybe just not doing exactly uh, what they know they need to be doing, God, I pray that they get that back today. Whatever the needs are, I hope you pray that we fulfill the needs of the people and they get where they need to be for you. God, we love you, praise you, and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. As I said, if you look at this, uh, at the first part of 16, and we talked about this some time back, uh, but it's worth going uh, again to see that uh, these men, uh, as they were going down, as 16 said, and it came to pass, as we went to pray. As we went to pray, so all of this drama, them getting thrown into prison in the inner part of the prison, all of this happened as a result of them going down to devotion, going to pray, just him and Silas. I don't think they had a big following. I don't think they had a bunch of people. Now, they could have been meeting somebody. I don't know. But based on what the Bible teaches us and tells us out of this scripture, these two guys were walking through the city going down to pray. I don't believe that they told everybody what was going on. I don't think they were drawing attention to themselves at all. I believe they were doing something that was uh, something they probably done every day. They probably done this often. They got together and they said, hey, we're going down. We ain't going to Bible study. We ain't going to church. We're going down to pray. And this whole drama starts as a result of them going to pray. That right there ought to tell the church something. We, we, we want to make a difference, amen, in the community, right? We want to make a, diff, diff, a, a difference and an impact on our country and in the lives of our families. I believe that right there is the one thing we neglect. Hey, listen, I'm guilty too, so I'm in the same boat uh, that we neglect more than anything. I don't believe you could preach on it enough. I don't believe you could say enough about a life of devotion or prayer. We've talked about this many times. You try to start any type of program in the church, and the devil will give you free reign. But the moment you start a prayer group, the moment you start a time of devotion where everybody's meeting, just to pray. You watch, he'll try to blow that up right off the get-go because he knows if he ever, if you ever understand and realize the power that you have as a result of praying to your Heavenly Father on a daily basis, on a steady basis, on a consistent basis, he knows he'll never be able to stop you when you tap into that power. He wants to stop things in its infancy, and he does the same thing with a devoted life. Amen? And devotion. Now, we see, as I said, this drama starts not because they were going to start revival, not because they were going to witness to anybody, not because they were going to debate Jesus in the town there, but because they were going to pray. They got thrown into jail and, and attention brought and attention brought to themselves. Uh, they were headed down to pray. That, as I said, ought to tell us something uh, of what this is showing us here in verse 16 that they went to pray. It all started and were headed because they were headed to pray. The most powerful weapon in the arsenal of a Christian, I believe, is prayer. Amen. Not good preaching. Listen, uh, we had a, a, a meetings here a little while back. Great preaching. I'm not taking anything away from great preaching, but but that's not where I don't believe that it's at. Uh, the greatest weapon that we hold as individuals as a, in the life of a believer is a life of prayer. Amen. And that's the one thing that we neglect more than anything else in the walk of a Christian, I believe it. I believe all y'all be like me and say, yeah, preacher, you're, you're right on track. We are all do that. We've all been guilty. Amen. Now, listen, I'm not saying if you have a, a time every day set aside that you devote to a time that you get away, and I don't mean praying with the TV on. I don't mean praying while golf's playing in the background. I'll throw me in on it, too. 
Amen. While we're doing it, while we're doing something else, you say, I can multitask. You don't need to multitask when you're praying, talking to the Father. All right. You might be doing one, but you ain't doing the other too good. A time set aside to pray. Amen. A time set aside uh, to pray. And I don't, uh, this is just really uh, what kicks this into high gear. I wanted you to see why they got thrown into prison and started praising when it didn't make any sense. But I wanted to start out with that. There are people that haven't missed. I, I tell you what, I was thinking about this uh, yesterday. You got people that ain't missed a church service on Sunday morning in 30 years. Amen. But I wonder how many times they neglect their prayer time. How many times they neglect not praying, amen? What I'm saying is it ought to tell us, and it's the one thing that seems to uh, get dismissed more than anything else. You, you get what I'm saying? I mean, we, we won't miss church, and, and, and thank God for faithful people. So don't, don't think I'm playing that lightly. I'm just saying that the one thing that, that we neglect more than anything else that Satan makes us forget or time just gets away from us is a time devoted to your Heavenly Father, just you, you and Him alone one-on-one. -on -one. Amen, that'll be the time that you'll forget. Amen, or the time that'll get away from you. Or just the time where you say, I just ain't got time, preacher. Amen. That's how we get charged up, is a life dedicated to prayer. Amen, dedicated to prayer. Paul and Silas is in prison here, this drama uh, in a dungeon, uh, this praising, as I said, when it doesn't make any sense. It was something out of this I wanted to share with you this morning, a few things, and I'll let you go. We find here, uh, when you get to where uh, they were, it says, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, verse 23 says, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer now to keep them safely. These wasn't hardened criminals. All because they went to pray, they got thrown into the roughest part of the prison, the inner part of the prison. As a result, it all started because they were going down to pray. Hey, man, if you think about that, I mean, really unfold that. Look here, verse 24 said, who having received such a charge, they said, this is important that you watch these guys and guard them with your life. Don't let them get out. Don't let them get loose. Don't let them walk to the mess hall. Don't let them do anything. Don't let them go out in the yard uh, for their hour a day that they get in the prison. Don't let them do anything. And the Bible says that uh, it, they, so who having received such a charge, thrust these men, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now get this picture. Not only did they throw these guys in the, the, the I guess you could say, the most, um, uh, I guess you could say the most uh, uh, guarded part of the jail, like solitary confinement, I guess you would say, uh, the, the, the hardest part, the part that the ones, they really don't want these people to get loose is what I'm trying to say. And I know there's a word for it. But not only did they throw them in there, amen, not only did they throw them in there, but they threw them in there, and then they fastened them the chains in the floor. They, they, I mean, if you'd have went by these guys and seen this, you'd think, man, a lot of them guys must really be mean. I mean, if you'd walk by their cell and say, what are you boys in for? They'd say, yeah, we went to pray. Really? We went down to pray. Really, all this started because you, yeah, that's all he's doing is going to pray. Now think, now, think about this. I want you to see it from the side we would see them as or from the outside world, what they would think. I and mean, you think these were two hardened criminals that just went on a killing spree and killed everybody in town. Amen. But they got thrown into the inner part. Their feet fastened in chains on the floor so they couldn't even move inside the cell they were locked up in because they were going to pray. I bet the people would say, if you told them that, they'd say, well, man, your prayer must really have a lot of, make a lot of impact. Mm. Hey, man, it must be something. Uh, if they told you in here for praying, who are you praying to? Hey, man, I bet they would be thinking. But now I want you to see it a little bit on the side of Paul and Silas. Their feet fast in the stock. And the Bible said at midnight... They pray and praise the Lord. They started praying more, amen. Questions 
coming from the darkness. Let me share this with you. First off, what makes the soul excited? Hey, man, what makes the soul uh, excited? Hey, man, I want you to see a few things. Verse 25 says that at midnight, at midnight but here's what i got to thinking i was trying to look it up to try to find out but the, the but the process now of them getting booked into jail and getting thrown into jail to go through i guess you could say the romans legal system um was a bit of a process this is what i want you to see here so this this didn't start at 11 o'clock that they got beat and thrown into jail and then all of a sudden soon they get in there they start singing praises to god this took a little bit of time. Uh, they took them before the council. They would have laid these stripes on them. And as the magistrates all would have had to come together to everybody to vote in one accord and all together to say, okay, here's the charge of these men. They had saying kind of like what our justice system is. Uh, it was a little different, of course, back then. But they had a process to go through to get these guys thrown into jail. Probably not as, as much paperwork as what it would be now, but nevertheless, they still had a process to give people, uh, you know, their rights, I guess you could say, which wasn't very many back then. But anyway, uh, they had a process that they went through. So this thing didn't start at 1130 is what I want to get. This thing probably started somewhere in the afternoon. Uh, like in the evening time that they got the stripes laid on them and, and they went before the magistrate and they said okay here's what we bring this charge up against these guys we're throwing them into the prison uh, they went in and met the jailer and said listen we want you to make sure these guys don't get loose so this was a process that would have took some time uh, is what I want you to see. So what I'm getting at, when these guys got thrown, they didn't get thrown into jail and start singing Amazing Grace. Okay? It wasn't, it wasn't that they got thrown in and said, Oh, praise the Lord, it's good to be here. It's midnight, let's start singing. No, it wasn't like that at all. I want you to see that for a reason. It says at midnight. But here's what my thought was. I wonder what they were doing before the praise party started. Now listen, this is a little bit of speculation uh, and some study I did on my part, but because of the time gap there. Here's my question. Why didn't they start at 7 o'clock? Why didn't they start praising God as soon as they got thrusted into the inner part of the prison? I believe they got in there and some time had passed. Some time, uh, let me say, some time to ponder on what has unfolded in the lives of Paul and Silas. Here's what I'm saying. They had time to think about what they were into and how they got in that situation. So you've got to understand, Paul and Silas were men just like us. See, we, we think because we go to church and everybody goes to church that we're just Christians and we ain't never in the flesh and we ain't never human beings or we ain't never uh, just men or women. People think that you walk around with the glory cloud over you all the time when they're outside the church looking in. But I want you to know, sometimes we mess up, all right? Sometimes we ain't so perfect with everything. So therefore, I want you to see, and as I got to thinking about, I wonder if these guys uh, were not just a little confused and disappointed as to why they were, why they were where they were how they might have thought about how in the world did we get in this position. Now, Paul, listen, Paul, Paul really took a, uh, the, he really took the fall. I mean, he got beat every time he turned around. He opened his mouth and said, Jesus, they'd try to kill him, throw him outside of town to die. I mean, he, got, he said something about the Lord and, and something about preaching, and they throwed him in the beast, in, in the arena with the beast at Ephesus, and they tried to eat him alive. So Paul kind of understood this. But I got to thinking how these two men were minding their own business and got thrown into jail. They didn't ask uh, the demon-possessed uh, 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 soothsayer to follow them around through town. She did, but I want you to know something. When you're living a life for the Lord, you just look different. You, you, just, you just look different. 
different. Don't you remember when Peter, and we beat Peter up right here, but I looked at it a little bit differently, when Peter was following Jesus at a distance, and I remember preaching one time on, uh, you don't need to follow him from a distance because you can get in a mess. You'll find yourself warming by the enemy's fire just like Peter did. But we find Peter following the Lord, he's watching the Lord, but he's with the, with the, with the people that wasn't uh, following the Lord. And he's hanging back just far enough to not be, he, he was trying to be on the fence, and that don't work being a Christian. You either are, you are all the way in, or you are all the way out, and you can't be both places. So therefore, Peter's following from a distance, and if you notice what the Bible says about them, the people looked at them, and, and something about Peter made him look different than everybody else, because they said, you're one of them. They didn't necessarily know Peter's name, they just said, you look like a Christian. Hey Amen. We beat Peter up over that verse right there, Jay. Uh, but there was something uh, really kind of cool about that whole situation. Because when you put him in the midst, you young people pay attention right here. When you took Peter and put him in a crowd of people his age, of his peers, uh, uh, that, that wasn't on the same level with him, or that didn't care nothing about Jesus, that didn't follow Jesus, Peter stuck out like a sore thumb. What I'm saying about you young men and young women, when you get outside of the church, I know you're supposed to have a halo on all the time, but I'm smart enough to know that you don't. Because I've been in the world too. I know how it works, all right? But I'm saying this, uh, you ought to be close enough to God as a Christian that when you get in a crowd of people or young people or who, whoever for that goes. Uh, me and Jay's talked about this many times. We work with a bunch of guys that don't care nothing about Jesus. Listen, and, and you try, you know, you don't want to be, uh, how do you say this and say it uh, the right way? You don't want to be like sticking your nose up in the air at them because you want to try to talk to the guys. And I think I have a really, a pretty good relationship with the men that I work with, but I like it every now and then when they say something about me being a preacher. Here's what I'm saying. You ought to stick out just a little bit. Amen. Amen. So you young people, when you go out, I ought to not be able to see you on Friday night with your buddies and you look the same as they do. And I ain't talking about the clothes you wear and the shoes you got on. I'm just saying there ought to be a glow about you. You ought to stick out. Just a, Here's what it ought to be because I know you do. And you say, oh, not me, preacher. Yeah, I know. But... Son, I know everybody's Jesus' second cousins in here, but for the other kids that go to church somewhere else, this is what they do. If they get out and they do something that they know they should not do, it, it, it ugh, that just didn't come out right. And not only do you recognize it, but the crowd you're hanging with recognized it. Now, they say it, and it didn't sound funny, because you remember back in that same instance when Peter's following from a distance. Peter, the Bible said, Peter pretty much cussed to try to prove that he wasn't Christian. And when he did, they said, your speech gives you away. You don't even cuss right, Peter. You don't cuss like one of us. Amen. You ought to not fit in so well that you, that you know all the lingo and you can say whatever you want to say when you're with your buddies or with your friends on Friday night or Saturday night and, and, and just fit in with them and then fit in with the church. You know what about the, the, God calls that? Lukewarm Christians. And you don't want to be one of them because he said he would spew you out of his mouth. Here's what I'm getting at. Listen, I'm not saying we don't mess up, but there ought to be something that makes you look a little bit of a, like an oddball when you're around a crowd of people that don't care anything about God or the God you serve. Amen. So, therefore, I want you to see that. So, <clears throat> I don't know how I got off on all that, but... I, I was doing it for a reason, I'm sure. And maybe we'll get back on track. But what I'm saying is, you see here uh, that, that, that like, just like Peter was, Paul and them uh, is walking. I, I remember now why I said all that. Paul and them is walking through the street, minding their own business, but are they really? Because there was something about them that, 
that rub the enemy the wrong way. Something about them that just, I'm not comfortable with you in my presence because I, even though you don't say anything, you bother me. You make me feel guilty about my... And they wasn't doing nothing. All they was doing was going down to pray. But nevertheless, this woman started following them. And no doubt she recognized them and said, I know who you are. And, and didn't do it once or twice. Followed them, the Bible said, for many days. So every day they come outside to go to pray or to meditation or whatever their routine was. Every day they come outside, there she'd be. Every day they'd, they'd go home from prayer meeting, and there she was, following them around, agging them on in the city. And I guarantee you that when she was walking behind them, she wasn't being quiet. Hey, man, look here. It said, because it grieved Paul. Verse number 17. Let me see if I can find it. It says, the same followed Paul, this lady followed Paul and us, and cried, cried, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. She's shouting this behind them through the streets. So therefore, this tells me, I don't know about you, I'm like, Paul, that would got on my nerves way before many days. I'd have been like, ain't you got somewhere you need to be because you're really getting on my nerves. <laughs> And I like to be like Jesus and turn the other cheek, but I don't want to body slam a girl right here in the streets here in Rome, but you're really getting on my nerves. Many days, the Bible said, she's following these guys. She's screaming behind them. You ever had somebody just annoys you? Oh, I'm telling you, watch I had a kid the other day. I'm training this boy. I'm training this guy. At work, and, and this guy, he, I come in, I'm, I was going up to the office, and he's behind his truck, and I couldn't see him, and he jumped up and scared me. I said, listen, you don't know this crowd around here, but these guys are old, and I don't like to be scared. I don't like to jump, all right? So I me and him had a few choice words, and I don't, he, he ain't going to scare me no more, just put it that way. But anyway... This, 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 these people, these people, she, she's walking, she's walking behind these guys, and she's screaming, hollering all the time, coming out. I wonder if they didn't walk around the corner, and they're like, oh, Lord, there she is. Amen. So the Bible says, Paul being grieved, he took this as long as he could, finally turned around and said, I'm done with this. Cast this demon out of her. Cast her spirit out. And that's how we end up where we're at. But, but getting back, and I, I'm going to try to hurry, but getting back to where uh, we were talking about, as this time is going by, when they get thrown in the inner part of prison, I really tried to find, because I was wanting it to really back up what, where I was going here, but, but there was some time between the time they got thrown in and the time that the praise party started is what I want you to see. So, therefore, there was a time gap. They had time to lay in there and think about their life. You know what? Man, I was smiling in Sunday school. Brother Keevan was talking about this. We don't take time just to sit. I think a lot of times by ourselves, we're so busy with everything going on in life that we don't take time just to meditate and ponder on things. And this is a good thing to do, by the way. And, and I believe these guys got thrown in the inner part, and they had time to ponder and time for the enemy to creep in their mind and say, see there? See there? You see what happens when you try to do the right thing? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever heard that voice in your head? See there what it got you for trying to be a good Christian? Hey, ma'am? And trying to do the right thing? See what it caused? See how God showed up for you? Hmm. They had time to ponder. I wonder if they were not a little confused, as I said, and disappointed. Uh, have you ever felt uh, like you've done everything right and are still end up in a mess and start to say to God, Why me, Lord? You ever feel that way? Listen, we've all been there. 
Now I know, as I said, I know uh, that, that these guys were in a mess. I'm sure they had got beat, uh, uh, stripes laid on them, so they're hurting. They're in the inner part of the jail. And I wonder, and I, I can't help but think, and listen, I know this is speculation uh, on some part of this, but based on my study, they did have time. And as I said, the praise party didn't start at 8. So from, say, 8 o'clock to midnight, there they had a few hours that nothing was going on. They were laying in there probably trying to, trying to see how bad hurt they were all because they went to pray. So I, I got to thinking about, I wonder if they sit there and if Paul didn't start thinking as, as to why did, I, why did I make this choice? Why in the world? Now, he didn't say it, and I don't know if he did, but, but wonder. I'm just thinking about if this would have been me. All right, let me put myself in there. I'd have probably been laying there thinking, why? Is this really worth it? Let me tell you how I know we think that way. We say that now, and we ain't even in jail. Is this even worth it? What's the point? Of all that you preach your heart out, you study all week, and you show up, and people people don't care. You you go by and you witness, and you talk to them, and talk to them, and talk to them, and they still don't show up to church. Is it really even worth it? Mm. Hey Amen. We've all been there. We've all been there. We've all uh, had those thoughts, the pain, uh, uh, the darkness uh, of tomorrow's prospects. They don't know maybe at that time what's going to happen. And, and as I said, a few more reasons they might have been depressed. They had obeyed the Macedonia call in verse, chapter 16, verse 9. Hey Amen. They had been leading people to Christ. They were doing everything right. How in the world do you end up in prison, not just in prison, but in the worst part of the prison for doing everything right? Hey, Amen. Paul, we find Paul in jail again when he was on the boat going when the, when the storm Euro Clyden comes up. He's a prisoner. He ain't a guest. Hey, Amen. For doing everything right. They had been sensitive to human needs. Now they're in prison for doing everything right here's what I'm saying do you see it ain't always about us for one thing but do you see how God sometimes puts us in position to be impactful and it might not be the most comfortable bed it might not be the most comfortable place to be, but it's hard to be impactful if Paul and Silas would have been staying at the Marriott, you see. Oh, my God. See, let me tell you, here's why. Because verse 26 wouldn't have mattered much if they'd have been at the Holiday Inn. Amen, Jay? Look here, verse 26 says, And suddenly, after the praise party started, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. You understand that God sometimes puts us in position when, he, when we finally realize and grow to the point, and I ain't quite got there yet, but when we grow to the point we realize it always ain't just about key, that sometimes God might be putting us in position for, for the earthquake to cause the most damage. Amen? So therefore, you young people understand that when you're in God's will and you go home and you might not quite be like, why can't I be like everybody else? Why can't my family be like their family? Why do they get nice things and I don't have nice stuff? Why am I in the position I'm in? And it might just be my God. It might just be that God's setting you up to make a bigger impact. It might just be that because when God sends the angels from heaven to make an earthquake at your house, the impact is going to be much larger than the ones that are living with a silver spoon in their mouth. Come on, somebody. Hey, Amen. That's truth. You say, how do you know that's truth? Because we just read it. Paul and Silas got thrown into jail for doing the right thing. Don't tell me God don't do that. All through the scriptures. But that's why we're still reading about them over 2,000 years later. 
Because in prison when they start, listen, oh my God. When they're at home in their comfortable bed singing Amazing Grace, don't quite do the trick. But bless God, when you're in the inner part of the prison and you don't know if the sun's going to rise tomorrow and you're singing Amazing Grace, it has a much bigger impact. Yes. Mm. My God. Hey Amen. So therefore, you might just be where you're at to be in the place for the biggest impact. See, oh, this is so good. You, I got to understand that they were in the inner part of the prison, and I told you that their feet were fastened to the, the hardest part of the foundation in the prison. The, the, the backbone of the prison was where Paul and Silas were. So, therefore, when the earthquake came... For God to get the earthquake to where they were, it had to be massive. To where it y'all ain't getting there. To where it shook the whole prison loose. Amen. See if you see if you if they'd have just been over here in the booking room where 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 they was just getting started, they said, Well, we'll just leave you uh, in the we'll just leave you next to the drunk tank for the night. That's on the outside. Don't ask me how I know that. But that's on the outside of the jail. So I ain't never been in a drunk tank in my life. I'm just aggravating you all, amen. But if they was on the outside of the prison, you see, it wouldn't have took much to break the door loose. Oh, hallelujah. I'm getting chill bumps, man. Hey, listen. But when they were in the inner part, the worst part of the jail, you see, and God sends the earthquake. He said, this is going to be, have to be a good one. He said, this is going to, this is going to wake everybody up. <laughs> Why? Because i got to get... Because i got to get my boys out of jail. And to do that, hey man, I've got to make a good one run through that prison. Because their feet are right screwed into the foundation. And I'm going to crack the whole foundation to get them out of where I don't want them to be anymore. Amen. So you might be where you're at for a reason. And it might not be this. And it might just be that you look around you, like I said, and you say, well, they're Christians and they're living in a, in a great place and they don't have no turmoil at home and, and everything. Yeah, but when the earthquake comes, the impact at your place is going to be a whole lot stronger than it is over here. Come on, somebody. Hey, man, God puts us in positions to make an impact on a mighty scale. Amen. So listen, and you say, this ought to give people hope like I was when I was growing up. Listen, I to go to school and try to make my Nike tennis. I didn't my, get my first pair of Nike tennis shoes. Uh, my first pair of Nike tennis shoes until I was a freshman in high school. Amen. Before that, it was Buster Browns and Tracks. Y'all remember them days? Them, the young people don't know. I, what's a track? Preacher, what's a track? I don't even sound right. Uh, exactly. We ain't even going to get into all it. They were cheap, all right? Amen. But look here, what I'm saying, I'm like, well, why can't I be like everybody else? Well, we don't know, but God puts you in position to where you can make the greatest impact. Golly. He sets you up not for failure. He sets you up for victory. Hallelujah. Amen. To the Lamb of God. So anyway, we find here that they had these things probably going through their mind. They had been leading people. They had been sensitive to human needs. Now they were in prison. Nevertheless, they praised God anyway. Because I believe Paul, if anybody understood, the impact would be greater. And I don't know if they did it. They didn't know the earthquake was going to come. They was just praising God when it didn't make any sense sense. Amen. And that's what happened as a result of praying and praising when it doesn't make sense. How can the soul delight in the dark? First off, by focusing on what, focusing on Jesus rather than the problem. By identifying with Jesus in suffering. By believing God it will bring us through no matter where we're, we're, we're at. Amen. Number two, what makes the soul feel hopeless the earthquake the prisoners were free the jailer becomes suicidal see this flips in here you understand i don't know that god didn't put them in there just for the jailer you understand this guy's out there now he goes from feeling i'm superman to guard these guys that are apparently really bad to suicidal Hey, man, because here's the thing we don't understand. You say God sent the earthquake to free the prisoners. Well, that's awful funny because none of them left. 
No. God sent the earthquake so that this jailer would see something out of them that he'd never seen before. I'm telling you. You know what? Trying to figure out what God's doing will absolutely run you crazy. That's why you just trust Him in everything He does in life. Amen. I believe that we're exactly where God wants us to be. Amen. And listen, this earthquake, the jailer became suicidal. He saw himself as a failure. So we see how the whole story flips right here. He's envisioned. Remember I said you got to understand it ain't always about you. Paul and Silas probably got to sitting in there licking their wounds between about 8 and 12. And said, you know, oh, poor, poor me, which they had every right to be. Don't misunderstand. But finally, about midnight, Paul says, what are we doing? Because I'm thinking, why did they wait till midnight? There had to be a reason. You say, that's all speculation, preacher. Well, I'm one preaching, so you just leave me alone. <laughs> but here's the deal. At midnight, somebody looks around and says, hey, you know what we need to do? We need to sing a hymn. Yeah. Silas, so, won't you sing that song? Silas, so won't you start out that song you sung last week in church before we had any stripes on us? They got to singing. The Bible said, and everyone heard them. See, as I said, you sang Amazing Grace when you're sleeping in the, in the, in the, in the, in the penthouse in the uptown suite. It ain't as loud, but you sang an Amazing Grace when you're living on the other side of the tracks. When life ain't so grand. When you're in the projects living like I was as a kid, when you sang Amazing Grace in that bed, it's a whole lot louder. Mm. So, hey, listen, you never know where it is God has you. He got you in a place to make an impact. Listen, he feared uh, this guy in vision. He, he saw himself as a failure. He envisioned shame for his family because he let these guys get loose. He feared the reaction of his superiors. He expected to die anyway, and he said, I'm just going to kill myself. You're talking about a hopeless situation. That's when the soul feels hopeless. Listen, suicide is now an epidemic in our country. So many people are willing to bail out way too quick. So sad. So sad. Suicide is a terrible solution. Hey, man, to what's going on. The pain, the pain uh, to those that we love that they never even think about. But this guy had a family at home, but yet he was going to draw the sword and kill himself. A permanent to solution. I always say a permanent solution to temporary problems. Hey, man. And thirdly, last but not least, what brings the soul freedom? Concern by another. Do thyself no harm, Paul says. Look here. He says here in uh, verse number uh, 27 it says and the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prisoner door seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled that's why I said you try to figure out God and it'll, it'll absolutely run you crazy cause this is me if I'd have been laying there and I'd have started singing Amazing Grace with all them stripes on me and the prison door swung open I'd have told Silas I'd have said guess what that might be a good sign God's telling us to get out Amen? That's the logical thought process behind that is the way I'm thinking. And if I'd have done that, they'd have been a dead jailer in the jail. And God would have said, you messed up. And I would have said, God, you're hard to figure out. Amen? I mean, come on. I'm singing. I mean, an earthquake just happened to happen at midnight right here when I'm singing. No, it had to be God. And it was God, but it wasn't for you to leave. It'll run you crazy if you try to figure God out. He's not logical. He told a guy to build a boat where it never rained. I mean, come on, who does that? Hey, Amen. Paul cried because the guy said he'd kill himself if the supposing the prisoners was gone. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Nobody left. See the impact? Because I want you all to know something. It wasn't just their doors that got sprung open. Everybody else in the jail's doors sprung open too. And these guys had made such an impact 
on the men around them because the Bible says the Bible says that they all heard them when they started singing and praising God. And the impact was such that the people around them that had nothing to do with this story said, you know what, I ain't leaving. Because I want to see what God's going to do next. Amen. You see how much of an impact you can have when you're doing everything right and doing what God wants you to do? Even in the worst places, they had the greater impact, not just on them, Paul and Silas, amen. Because you'd think the spring prison doors come open, these guys around them be like, this ain't for me, the door's open, I'm gone. But they had made such an impact on, boy, I'd like to heard that praise party. I don't know what they were singing, but it had to be good. Amen. But these guys were listening. They were, they, were, they were grasped to what was going on. They were seeing something they'd never seen before. Amen. They were seeing God in a mighty way to the point that they said, I ain't leaving yet. I'm going to stay right here because I'd rather, I'd, rather be I'd rather be in here with Jesus than to be out there in the mess I was in before with Satan. Amen. So they stayed in there. And Paul said, hey, we didn't, not only me and I, we're all still here, you see. So therefore you find, look here, and it says, uh, for we are all still here. Uh, uh, he told the keeper of the prison, don't kill yourself, we're all here. And Paul said, verse 28, but when Paul cried with a loud voice, verse 29, then he called for a light. Hallelujah. Boy, that preach right there too. Amen. He called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Now this is the jailer. Same guy they told, keep these guys and don't let them loose to prisoners. They're prisoners of Rome. This guy's a Roman soldier, a Roman jailer. He springs in with a light. Look here what he said. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow. Come out and said, Sir, notice he brought them out. Hey, man, he brings them out. And said, Come out of here. You, you boys, you all don't belong in here gets them out and says, what must I do to be saved? Because now you see the attention has turned. See, when we realize that life ain't just about us, we start to recognize what's going on around us. And we see other people that are hurting. And we see other people. And Paul and Silas, I bet you anything Paul said, that's why we got thrown into jail. You don't think God cares about one soul? This is how much he loves us. The Bible said he left the 90 and 9 and went for the one to bring it back. That's how much God loves you. He turned a prison upside down just to get you saved. He turned a prison upside down to get to where you're at. He'd make things work in history that are monumental to get to one person. I preached, first message I ever preached, just one. If it had just been one, I believe Jesus would have come. That's a love that we can't even understand, man. That's a love that baffles me every time I think about it. No way that God loves us that much. He does. He does. I bet you Paul and Silas said, this is why. This is why we're here. You know, a lot of times we've got to sit back and just wait sometimes for the impact to come and sit there and say, all right, God, why do you have me here? Why am I in this position? Why am I in this situation? And I, until you show up, I'm just going to keep on praying and keep on praising and just stay there. Hey, man, because you're there for a reason. You're there for a reason. So, therefore... We see what brings freedom. Concerned by another, do thyself no harm, Paul said. Consistency of believers. He said, we are all here turning to God. What must I do to be saved? A message of hope. Believe, he said. Believe on the Lord. Look here what he said here. He said, then called for a light. What must I do to be saved? And 31 says, and they said, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Here's my question. We know the jailer gets saved, and then he takes the two prisoners home to his house with his family. You don't think they made an impact? First time he meets them, they said, these guys are bad news. Put them in the inner part of the prison and fasten them to the floor. Don't let them loose. If I'd have been the jailer, I'd have been like, I'd have been there, guns drawn the whole night. I'd be like, something right with these guys. Then by midnight, he's taking them home to meet the family. Could you imagine this? Could you imagine this? Here this guy comes walking in. I'm just about done. Here this guy comes walking in, dragging these two guys on chains. His wife said, what, what in the world? It's, it's 2 o'clock. No, what are you doing? Oh, honey, I just want you to know, these guys were the worst guys in the prison, and 
we got busted out, and I brought them home to meet you. <laughs> How would that go over? I know what my wife would be thinking. You get them guys out of here. Amen. But he brings them in to the family to meet the family. And the Bible said his whole family got saved. But here's how I think. I wonder how many other guys in that jail bowed a knee to Jesus that night and got saved. Hey, man, I wonder how many of the rest of them did. The jailer trust, the jailer, the jailer trust in Christ wanted them to minister to others, wanted his family to hear the gospel. Listen, when we get saved, we want others to be saved. What was and might have been. Hey, man, listen, he wanted everybody else the same shape he was in. He realized that was the answer. Praising God when it don't make any sense. Let's bow our heads. I'll tell you what, it'll sure, when you see stuff like that, or it does for me, sure makes me see my situation a whole lot differently. There's a lot of people that are going through stuff and have been through stuff that we can't even imagine. Kids going home into messes that we don't even understand. But I hope and pray that that gives them lift and gives them hope to say, you know what, I might be exactly where God wants me to be. Because the impact level where I'm at is going to be monumental when it happens. And you know, I was thinking about this. God didn't just, He didn't, this is why I say, you got, you got, we got to watch how we deal with things. And we got to praise whenever, because we're not praising because of anything that we have or what we do. A lot of people do. A lot of people praise because they got it made. <laughs> we don't praise God for that reason. We praise God because of who He is. Amen. And, and when they started praising God in the jail right there at midnight after being beat half to death, they start praising God, man. And, and then the doors came open. I wonder if God would have sent the earthquake if they'd have still been sitting there pouting. Amen. And a lot of us, maybe me included, would have been like, man, I'm hurting too bad to sing. But boy, when they done something out of the ordinary, God done something extraordinary. And that's how he works every single time. Let's stand for just a moment, head bowed, eyes closed. Chris is praying. If you're here and lost and don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to come. Turn your life over to him. And if you have been and you need to get closer to him, I want you to come. Whatever the need is this morning, I ask you to come. Go ahead, Tammy. I've been on the mountain and